All right, we're getting started here. Welcome Debbie, Janice, Gary, Mary, Pam, Robin, and Virginia, yay. We'll give it a couple of minutes here and make sure everyone can find their way to us. All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started here with uh, introductions. Uh, my name is Kristen McCallum. I'm the Adult Services Manager at the Algonquin Library. Um, thank you for joining us this evening for um, one of our, our uh, first webinars. We've had a couple now, so we're, you know, getting the hang of things a little bit. Um, I thought first I'd uh, like to tell you about some of our other upcoming opportunities to uh, to um, engage with us online, uh, attend other webinars. Um, and so I've been in the process of rescheduling some things and trying to make some of these programs available to us, even though we can't be together in person at the library. Uh, and so uh, one of the programs I was very happy to be able to reschedule uh, is um, uh, Barry Bradford, who I know is um, someone you all be very familiar with, his programs. His program, Political Satire from Mark Twain to Steve Colbert, has been rescheduled to Sunday, May 17th at 2 p.m. So you can find the link to register for that on our website. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to um, welcoming Barry back. Uh, and so that, again, that's going to be May 17th at 2 p.m. Um, and the topic was political satire from Mark Twain to Stephen Colbert. Um, some other programs that we have coming up include, um, we've got some job search classes coming up. We have job search like a pro. We're having um, Erica Ruckham from a Certified Professional Resume Writer. Uh, she'll be talking to us on May 11th about resumes and on May 18th about interviewing. So uh, those should be up and available for you to register on our website. And then we are also, um, uh, oh, this Thursday we have um, uh, Tina Beard, uh, who is um, a genealogy librarian and uh, local history uh, historian. Um, she will be presenting on recreating the Great War, finding your military service information for your World War I veteran. That's going to be this Thursday. Um, at 7 p.m. So um, that's uh, so for those of you history buffs out there, if you've started tracking your family history and would like to know more about how to use those service records to kind of fill in the gaps and uh, for your ancestors, that would be a great program to attend. Uh, we also have our um, weekly genealogy. Uh, Zoom chats, we're calling them. Um, it's librarians from all over Illinois, really, are uh, available and uh, our panelists answering questions. They have a different topic every week. Uh, I believe tomorrow's topic is about using Ancestry, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but if you check our website and our events, you can look for that and, and sign up for that. So I would encourage you to do so. Um, so those are just a couple of the things that are on the horizon. I encourage you all to uh, continue to check our website for updates. We're constantly um, adding things to the calendar as quick as we can. Uh, so um, just keep your eye out for that. We're also, uh, we've been sending out weekly e-newsletters uh, where we try and highlight programming coming up the following week. So. Uh, if you're not getting those, I believe you can register for that on our website. Um, 
All right. So now that you know about other programs we're doing, we'll get to this evening's program. I'm very happy to welcome William Hazelgrove uh, to us, who's going to be talking about, um, uh, he's going to be presenting on a uh, from his new book, which is uh, coming out May 12th. So uh, hot, off, hot off the press. Um, uh, so, um, and I'll be sending out a link if, if that's something that you're interested in ordering for yourselves. Um, I'll, I'll send you some information how to do that. Um, but uh, I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about William if you haven't uh, seen him here before. He has presented at the library, so uh, he may be a f familiar face to you. Uh, we have, um, so William, he's a, a, a national best-selling author of 10 novels and seven nonfiction titles. His books have received star reviews in Publishers Weekly, Kirkus, Booklist, Book of the Month selections, ALA Editor's Choice Awards, Junior Library Guild selections, Library Guild selections, History Book Club selections, and Option for the Movies. Uh, he was the Ernest Hemingway Writer in Residence, where he wrote in the attic of Ernest Hemingway's birthplace. He has uh, written articles and reviews for USA Today, the Smithsonian Magazine, and other publications. He has been featured on NPR, All Things Considered, The New York Times, LA Times, Chicago Tribune, C-SPAN, USA Today. Um, all covered his books uh, with, with features. Um, his books, Tobacco Sticks, The Pitcher, Real Santa and Madam President have been optioned for screen and television rights. His book, Madam President, the Secretary, the Secret Presidency of Edith Wilson is currently in development. Um, he has four forthcoming books, Sally Rand, American Sex Symbol. I believe that was one that I think we did here at the library. Uh, Morristown, The Kidnapping of George Washington, The Brilliant Con of Cassie Chadwick, 160 miles, I'm sorry, 160 minutes, the race to save. Is that right? Yeah, the race to save Titanic, right. The race to save. Ah, and now we have another book. So um, we're very pleased to welcome, I know you won't be able to hear us giving our, our virtual hand claps, <laughs> uh, but um, please uh, give a virtual warm welcome uh, to William Hazelgrove. So welcome. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for everybody being here. Let's jump right into it. Um, just there, if you want to ever, uh, I do a raffle every month. If you shoot me an email at bhazelgrove, I'll put you in and you'll get my newsletter. But let's get going. Um, this is a book that I wrote. I'd heard a lot about this story. Uh, I read David McCullough's 1776. First time I heard about this. Um, and this guy named Henry Knox, who's this 25-year-old bookseller who pulls 60 tons of cannons in the winter of 1725 all the way to George Washington uh, outside of Boston. Now, I heard this a bunch of times, and when I went to research it, I found mostly there were kid books, kids' books on it. So there's nothing, you know, that I could really dig my teeth into. And so I had to go with all primary sources to find out what's going on. Now, this picture you're looking at this is actually a painting by Tom Lovell. And this is a great depiction of that, what the noble train looked like. And we'll talk about why they call it the noble train soon. Um, but you can see the oxen, the sleds, and the cannons. Now, just so you know, 60 tons of cannons is the equivalent of 28 SUVs. So imagine pulling that in the dead of winter on oxen and sleds. Um, so this is a Herculean feat. It took about almost three months to do it. Nobody thought it could be done, but the war depended on it. Um, so let's get into and find out where these cannons actually were. Now, uh, Benedict Arnold, uh, he had taken Fort Ticonderoga, which is up on Lake Champlain, and Lake George sort of guards these two lakes on a, a river portage. Now, when they took, when, when Benedict Arnold took this, he realized that there were 60 tons of cannons there. They knew they were there, but the problem was you couldn't, it's 300 miles from Boston. So, you know, there's really nothing that um, they could do. Now, he was assisted by Ethan Allen when he took the fort. Um, this is kind of a neat photo of 
these howitzers, these, these mortars. Now some of these cannon, and we'll talk about this some more, weighed 5,000 pounds, all right? So these, these are pretty big cannon, these are monsters. Um, and the United States, or the Colonials, rather, had no artillery at all. They had nothing, okay? Um, and, and so they need these, they need these. Now, George Washington, all right, uh, let's set the scene here. George Washington arrives outside Boston. All right, uh, the situation is Lexington and Concord have, have occurred, and the British have hold up, and Bunker Hill have hold up in Boston. So uh, sort of a siege is developing. Now, uh, George Washington is not the man we think he is uh, in history. He's actually been a planter for 15 years, and he knows nothing about siege, warfare at all. In fact, when he was in the military before, he wasn't that good. He did a lot of things that didn't really work out for him. So he's coming there after living off his wife's money, Martha Washington was very wealthy, for 15 years, and he gets to Boston, and he sees this army that is just basically a rabble. It's it's a lot of farmers, it's all these militia that have come together, and Washington is sort of aghast. He, he's like, this is what I'm supposed to fight the British with. And he quickly realizes he has no artillery. Now, here, here's something you wanna know. You have to have artillery to get any occupied army out of a city and, and siege warfare. If you have no artillery, you'll never get them out. So, so they have none. And add to that, there's all this disease, there's pestilence, uh, yellow fever. Also, everybody in the army just keeps leaving. Um, they have no, you know, allegiance really to the army per se. They're just, I'm going home to work on my farm. So this is sort of this, this you know, discombobulated group. And Washington is, is very depressed by this because he also has no gunpowder. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, he, he sort of has inherited a really big problem. Now, Let's talk about this guy. This is Henry Knox. Henry Knox is a big guy. He's actually a sort of rotund. Uh, you know, we would call him heavy today. Um, he's 25 years old, and he's a bookseller. Um, he actually uh, has been supporting his family since he was nine, when his dad left the family, and he took over to support his brother and his mother, and he went to work for some booksellers in Boston. Now, no formal education but he educates himself by reading all these books. And the booksellers encouraged him to do this. So when he comes of age, he's thinking about having his own bookstore. And he's a very, he's very gregarious. He, uh, he's sort of flamboyant. He wears a, a scarf wrapped around his left hand because uh, he blew off his fingers in a hunting accident. So he's very self-conscious about that. But, you know, he, he's his convivial guy, so he's, he's actually going to be a good book merchant. And he's thinking about getting his own, his own store when this happens. He's actually out walking one night through Boston on a cool night in March. There's still snow on the ground. And he hears bells ringing, and he goes to, he runs to the middle of the square, and what happened is the Boston Massacre. And he ends up right in the middle of it. And up to now, he's becoming, he's, he's sort of a rebel in training almost, if you will. Um, John Adams and others are stopping at the store. And, but this pushes him all the way over where he says, you know what? We're not going to be able to stay with Britain. This is not going to work out. We have to separate. So this sort of radicalizes him. Being in the middle of seeing these, uh, these colonials cut down by the British. And from then on, he believes that America has to go its own way. Independence is the only answer. Now, he gets his own store. It's the London Bookstore. And he's, it's kind of becomes known, he becomes known as a rebel bookseller. And also it becomes sort of a salon. Uh, actually, believe it or not, the British hang out there. Tories hang out there. Uh, Tory ladies hang out there. And, and so Knox, sort of, he's sort of a smart businessman. He caters to all sides. He caters to the rebel. Balls, he caters to the British, and, he's, and he does very well. He's actually one of the first booksellers to use what we call today blurbs, where he takes uh, you know, reviews and puts them on books. And he also discounts his books because he thinks poor people should be allowed also to buy books. 
So he's doing very well. Now, he meets her, Lucy Flucker. Now, Lucy Flucker is basically the daughter of, uh, you know, somebody way up in the British colonial government. And uh, so she's a royalist, but she becomes sort of enraptured with Henry Knox, who is of no family, uh, a rebel. And so her father is just aghast. And he's like, you know, you, you can't. You can't see this man. And Lucy, of course, does. And they start to make plans to get married. And again, her father is, is just like, if you marry this man, you will never be accepted in society. But Lucy is a very independent woman. And so she says, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Now, meanwhile, George Washington, his army is literally falling apart outside of Boston. Um, just, you know, disease again disease no uniforms no gunpowder um it's not looking good and and they're taking on a superpower britain which you know the whole world thinks this is just folly that you know the united states is just gonna be crushed by britain now when lexington lexington and concord happen all right we're going back in time a little bit here knox is at this bookstore and he realizes then with these two battles, it's the point of no return, that he's going to have to join the army. And he really doesn't want to do that because he has his, you know, he has Lucy, he has the bookstore, he has all these things. And he's thinking, you know, but I've got to go join the colonial army. Now, what happens is Paul Revere tips him off. And Paul Revere says, listen, you're going to get arrested. Now, he and Lucy had, had, are married at this point, and he realizes that if they stay in Boston, you know, they're going to end up in prison. And so what they, they start to devise a plan to escape, to escape Boston. Now, a lot of uh, colonial rebels are doing this. They're sort of slipping off and joining George Washington's army. So one night, they close the bookstore. Knox closes it. There's actually British officers in the store. He makes a big show, just another normal night. And then he goes home, and then he and Lucy leave their home and make their way down to the harbor. Uh, they, you know, Lucy hides his sword in her petticoat. They wear disguises, and they go down there, and there's a little boat, and they, they row the boat out into the harbor under the cover night. And, and Lucy really realizes then, you know, she writes later that, they were never coming back to Boston, that, you know, their life was changed forever. And Knox realizes the same thing, that, you know, that this Boston is now a young republic. And so what happens is Knox puts Lucy with some friends, and then he goes and he joins the army. Now, he's a man who's educated himself in the ways of firing cannons. He actually joined a cannon unit in Boston. So he has some hands-on experience. He's also read a lot about fortifications, how to move things, how to move artillery. So he is knowledgeable. And so they put him to war building fortifications. And you know, this is the strangest meeting in history. He, he's working on these fortifications and he's walking down a road and George Washington's going out to you know, look at him and they, they meet and they start to talk and George Washington's very taken with him. Again, Knox is voluble, he's very knowledgeable. And Washington brings him along to look at the fortifications. Now, George Washington realizes that young men, young officers, Knox is 25, are, are just what he needs because he needs people who have a can do spirit. And that's Henry Knox, who basically say, you know, I know everything's against us, but, you know, we can overcome this. And so he surrounds himself with talented young officers who Henry Knox is one. So he sort of becomes his right-hand aide at this point. And he writes Lucy and says, you know, I'm, I'm with George Washington now, which is pretty amazing because, again, he has no formal military training at all, but neither did most of the men in the army. So Washington's generals are all right, a lot of them are right off the farm, or in Knox's case, he's right out of the bookstore. Now, this is what's called Dorchester Heights, so the Heights of Dorchester. These are some hills overlooking Boston. If you look at this, 
You see these people up there. Now, this is unmanned, either by the British or the Americans. And the British are a little concerned about that. And they're like, you know, General Howe, they say, General Howe, we should probably take Dorchester Heights. Because if the Americans put cannons up there, we could be in real trouble. Hal, who has no regard for the, for the Americans at all, unless for George Washington, says basically, don't worry about it. They don't have any artillery. And if they do take it, we'll take it back. Not a big deal. But this will factor in, in a big way, into the way the Americans will fight this war. Now, the cannons up in Fort Ticonderoga are sitting up there. And again, and these are old cannons. A lot of them don't work, all right? They haven't been fired for many years, but it's all that the Americans had to work with. Now, George Washington is a very sly guy. He actually goes to Knox and says, listen, I'm gonna make you colonel of the artillery. And Knox is like, great, you know, uh, fantastic. Um, where's the artillery? And George Washington says, well, there isn't any. And this sort of puts Knox in a situation. And Knox knows about the artillery up in Fort Ticonderoga. And he immediately says, you know, there's these cannons up in Fort Ticonderoga. I could go get those. Now, George Washington was probably pretty smart here because he has this man who has this can-do spirit, but also who really wants to be head of something. And without any artillery, he's the head of nothing. So did he pick Knox because he knew he'd want to do this? Maybe. But also, he lets Congress know that he wants to do this. And by the way, George Washington's uh, War Council is not for this. In fact, they think, this is terrible. This is folly. We're going to waste money. Um, this is going to be a failure. But George Washington pushes on, and he gets some money from Congress, and he tells you know, Henry Knox, go, go get these cannon and bring them back to us. So Henry Knox starts out in November of 1775, right in the middle of winter. Um, now in this picture, he's actually starting out with just militiamen and his brother, all right? So he's, they're gonna pick up the oxen, the sleds along the way. But this is really, this, they're, they're very, they're, they're sort of just starting out and trying to get up to Fort Ticonderoga at this point. Now, immediately, they hit a winter storm, and it's awful. Um, it's, these New England storms, these Northeasters are just horrible. It almost stops them right where they are. Knox writes about it later. By the way, Henry Knox keeps a journal, and I've had to page through this thing, obviously, um, online, uh, but it's all there is, and it's logistically speaking, it's good, but it doesn't give a lot more. So it's really him sitting down on a stump and writing down what happens in shorthand. So this is one of the sources I use, but it, it's it's sort of a you know I had to use a lot of other different things because he only he sort of writes in this shorthand, but he does write about the snowstorm. And he says it almost stopped them. So they go up and they reach Fort George. Now, Fort George is sitting on Lake George that they have to cross to get to Fort Ticonderoga. So it's, it's great they've gotten this far. They have no, again, no oxen and sleds with them at this point, all right? But they have to get across Lake George to get up to Fort Ticonderoga. Now, it's winter and uh, this is a brutal winter. And this is a good picture showing what they had to deal with because the lake is mostly frozen, except for this little, if you look at this picture now, there's like a, a little canal in the middle of the lake. And that's what they're gonna have to go up on. They're gonna have to sort of, and they're hoping the lake will not freeze, okay, before they can get up to Fort George and get back. So it's a race against time already. I mean, and again, these are not polar explorers. These, these are people in, homespun cloth, and so, you know, it's very, very cold, to say the least. So they reach Fort Ticonderoga, and the people at this fort are amazed that Knox and these men came up. They're like, what are you doing here? 
And Knox says, we've come to get the, the cannons. And of course, they don't know anything about this. And they think he's nuts. They're like, how are you going to get these back? Well, this is where Henry Knox really excels because he says to them, listen, we're doing this for the revolution. We're doing this for George Washington. We're doing this to get the British out of Boston and we need your help. And they help him. So Knox is very good on his feet. He's very good he, it, getting people to his side, getting people to his cause. So he goes through the cannons and he finds 59 cannons that he feels he can use. And of the, these 59 cannons weigh about 60 tons or 120,000 pounds or 28 loaded SUVs. This is what they're gonna have to drag back to Boston, George Washington. So how do they do this? Well, first they got to get it out of the fort. And this is, this is an ordeal in itself. So the, the fort is actually about three miles off Lake George. So they have a portage road and they have a river. So they use both. They use these piragwas, gondolas, and bateaus to transport the, the cannons, as well as block and tackle oxen, anything they can basically to drag these things down to Lake George. So they finally get them all down there and they have to load into these. And if you look at this picture now, this, this is pretty representative. These, these flat sort of canoes pretty much sink when they put, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 pounds of cannons in them. And they're just at the water line, which is not very stable, but it's all they, they can deal with. So they do that. Now, they got to head back. They got to head back to Fort George. And again, Knox is very paranoid that the lake is going to freeze. Now, coming up so far has not been bad, all right? The weather's kind of cooperated. They've actually had a fairly decent trip up. This is not going to be the case heading back. When they head back. They head into the hell of Lake George. And the reason it's hell is because a storm hits, a wind hits, they can't use their sails, and they have to push through with poles through the ice. So they're in these large canoes, if you will, loaded down with 120,000 pounds of cannon and men, and they're hitting the wind head on, and it's freezing, and they have to push through this. And, you know, these boats are almost getting swamped immediately, and they're moving just so slow it's unbelievable. So this is very different coming back down. All right, so they stop on Sabbath Island. Now, Sabbath Island's about in the middle of the lake. And on there, Indians come up. Now, the relations between colonials and the Indians is not good. There are massive massacres on both sides, very savage. Um, but a man named General Shiler, who George Washington contacted and said, listen, help Henry Knox do this thing, had actually contacted the Indian tribes in the area and said, look, let us pass, don't bother us. Um, because actually they could have been massacred at any time by the Indians or the British, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so the Indians actually are friendly. Uh, they, they help them, they give them some food on Sabbath Island. And you know they spend, they make big fire, put their feet to the fire, trying to thaw out before they start on the next day. So they start on and then the boats start to sink with the cannons. Now, this is a great picture of this lake, frozen as it is. Um, now, most people would say, oh, we lost this cannon, leave it at the bottom of the lake. Henry Knox doesn't. He stops, and they pull these cannons back up out of the lake. It's amazing. They use block and tackle. They use ropes. They got more stuff come, more men come from the fort. Uh, it's incredible. But Knox believes, and rightly so, that George Washington needs every single cannon to fight the British. He can't afford to lose any, and he doesn't. So this is hell upon hell. They're in a storm, these cannons are sinking, it's very slow going, they're freezing, and, and you know, they're just moving so slowly. Well, Knox goes ahead and he reaches Fort George. So here's another thing I wanna stress about this. Um, this expedition is going to be spread out. And think of Henry Knox as sort of like a, a general who's moving around the troops all the time. It's not like today where everybody sort of gets together or moves together. 
these belts are all struggling on their own to get across this lake. So some are moving along, some are not, some have sunk, some are trying to get the cannons out. So Knox thinks it's better for him to go to Fort George and try and get ready for the next phase of the trip. Um, and, you know, hopefully these boats will make it in. But before he does, he sits down in a room and he writes to Lucy and he also writes to George Washington. Now, when he writes to Lucy, he's, Knox does not exactly tell the truth. He had written her a letter before he left and said, listen, I'm going on this mission and it's not going to be dangerous, but I'll probably be back in two to three weeks, which was a total lie because this was going to take much, much longer. Well, now he writes her and he says, uh, this is going to be much longer than I thought. And, you know, bear with me. She's Lucy, who's, stay, who's pregnant, by the way, and staying with friends, strangers, and who will never see her father again, or her mother, or her sister, who's been ostracized for her marriage to Knox, has to deal with the fact that Henry Knox is probably now ma married to the revolution, and that their fortunes will rise and sink that. So, I mean, they, had, they barely spent any time together. But Knox says this, this is for the greater good. So then he sits down, and he writes... George Washington letter, where he says, look, we made it back over. This was really hard. I'm waiting for the, the oxen and the sleds, and I'm waiting for, you know, the, these, these cannons to come in, come across the lake. And then he writes a line, and he says, I hope in 16 or 17 days' time to be able to, pre to present to your excellency a noble train of artillery. Now, this is, this is a very interesting line because Knox is religious. He's a very religious man, as most were in the um, 18th century. And he elevates this quest to the Holy Grail. And he's calling it a noble train of artillery. So he's saying to Washington, you know, he believes that the fight for the revolution, the fight for America is divinely inspired. And this is divinely inspired. So it's now been elevated to this next level, which, again, that's where the name of the book comes from, but it is known as the noble train from here on out. Now, he's got a problem. He needs about 90 oxen and 45 sleds to do this, and there is none. Uh, General Schuyler was supposed to supply him with some, but he hasn't yet. And this is... You know, this is 19th century or 18th century communication. Uh, the best you can do is a guy on a horse galloping around calling an express rider. Other than that, you don't have any communication. So here's the situation. The boats are coming in with the cannons. He doesn't have any way to move them further. He's contacted a man named Palmer, who's sort of a shyster, um, on his way up and said, can you get me these oxen sleds? Because he, he didn't believe Shiler could do it. Well, Palmer says, sure, I'll do it for money. And so he takes Knox's money, but he hasn't come up with it either. So Knox is desperate. So what's he do? He takes off and he heads back down toward Albany with him with a few men. And again, in this horrible, horrible snowstorm. Um, and he gets lost in the woods, uh, almost perishes from the cold. But, you know, he, he has to go find Shiler and Palmer to find out what's happened with these oxen and sleds. Well, he, he finally gets down and reaches Shiler, who says, basically, listen, Palmer's a joke. He's ripping you off. Do not deal with him. I'll get it for you. But he also meets a guy named Jim Becker. Now, Jim Becker, he's a teamster. And that means kind of what it means today. He's a trucker of his time. Those oxen you see in the picture, those are actually the, the, the heavy-duty trucks of their time. And what Teamsters did in the 18th century, uh, or rather 17th century, was that they would run around and transport all this freight. And they would do it for armies, they'd do it for all sorts of things. Um, they'd use horses, they'd use oxen, they'd use wagons. But this is what they did, they moved freight. Or in this case, they would move cannons. So Becker and Shiler are actually two fantastic people for Knox to know because they actually know how to move something like 120,000 pounds of cannon. Uh, so they actually get him the, the sleds, the oxen, 
and Becker goes up there to sort of run the whole thing. So, so because Knox, for all his reading, has no idea really how to move these oxen and sleds. He's making it up as he goes. So finally, finally, they start back on January 2nd, 1776. Um, you get this, again, this picture, which I had in the beginning, is, is, is really good because this is actually shown going through the Berkshire Mountains, which we'll talk. But you can see the oxen are, are two to a yoke and, and they're, you know, they have the militia on the outside and then the sleds behind. And the sleds are taking off their carriages, or rather the, the cans are taking off their carriages and broken down. And, you know, obviously they need a certain amount of snow for this to work at all. Uh, and which is going to always be a problem here, um, you know. But this is the best way to come up with transport. And so the Teamsters are on the outside, and they're orchestrating this and getting these oxen to move, which is very difficult, and getting them to do what they want to do. Now, this is, uh, this is sort of a picture, if you will, of uh, the, the map, the, the, the route they're going to follow. And, and you can see they're coming down here. If you look here, they're coming down from St. George, Saratoga, the Stillwater, and straight on down, and they're gonna cross the Hudson four times doing this, okay? And the Hudson is frozen, but it's in various states of freezing and thawing, okay? And then they're gonna take a right, and then they're, unfortunately the, the banner there's in the way, but that's the Berkshire Mountains that they're gonna to have to cross, which are formidable. So this is the route you're taking down. They're going down, they're gonna hook a left and then head over toward Boston. Now, they start and they have all sorts of problems. Um, first of all, these sleds and these oxen and these cannons, everything's very precarious. Um, they're dealing with snow, they're dealing with mud. And what would happen is they'd be on these, let's talk about roads. Roads are not like our roads, they're mostly trading paths that have been widened. And so they're going down these paths and then suddenly the sleds will get tilted and they roll over. So you have a 5,000 pound cannon that's now on the ground. So you have to undo the, take the oxen off, put the sled back over, use block and tackle to get the cannon back, back onto the sled. This would happen over and over. So these Teamsters are, are earning their money big time because this is very slow, it's very cumbersome, uh, there is snow, but then the snow gets thin. It's, it's sometimes it will thaw out and they're pulling it through mud. And again, they're going to have to cross the Hudson four times. Now this is a picture of the Hudson in summer, obviously, but here's what they're gonna have to deal with, this, okay? The Hudson River, which is basically this big vein running, running right through the middle of the United States or you know, the colonial, the colonies. And, and and there, he's going to have to go across this with this 60, 60 tons or 120,000 pounds of cannons. Now, Knox is very paranoid that the ice is not going to be thick enough to support all this weight. So what's he do? He drills these holes. And basically the theory is that you drill a hole down into the ice, the water comes back up over it and goes out over the ice on the river and then thickens, freezes again. So he's kind of making ice roads, if you will. And he's doing this because he knows that with a 5,000 pound cannon, a couple thousand pounds of men and sleds, you know, if, these, if it's not really frozen thick, they're gonna go right through. And this is the big, the big fear because the weather is fluctuating up and down. So how do they do it? Well, they do it like this. A teamster holds an ax, he walks next to the sled and the, and the oxen, and they go across very slowly. And he's at the ready because the reason he has the ax is if that cannon goes through, you've got to cut that rope. You've got to swing that ax, cut that rope to save the oxen, to keep the oxen and everything else going to the bottom of the, the river. So they go across the first time with a 5,000 pound cannon and they make it. So then everybody sort of follows them. And so this is, this is great because it's the first crossing of the Hudson, no cannons go through the ice. So then they come up to the second crossing. Again, they have the, the walking very slowly, the ice is creaking, um, he's walking with the ax at the ready, and this happens. The cannon goes right through the ice. 
Now, the teamster swings the ax and cuts loose the oxen, so the oxen don't go in. But they also have ropes attached to the cannon. I remember before I said the knox will not leave a cannon behind. This is true again. They have these ropes attached to it. They take rope and they drag it to the shore, get block and tackle, connect the oxen to it, wrap it around a tree, and they pull these things back up from the bottom of the river. And this takes all day. And But again, Knox cannot afford to lose any, especially the big cannons, because he needs the big cannons because these can threaten the British in the harbor who are out there a mile or two. And he needs what's called the Big Berthas, which are the 5,000 pound cannons. All right, so they get it up and they keep going. And here, and this is sort of a, a later era cannon, but it shows you, you know, probably the weight is about the same, what a 5,000 pound cannon would be to, to try and pull this thing up out of the ice, which again, you know, all these Teamsters would have to stop and all come together and again, use all the oxen and block and tackle, everything they can. And again, there's, there's no machinery. There's, there's just, you know, men and oxen to, to move these, these very heavy cannons. So now they're getting toward the Berkshires. And the Berkshires are these mountains that they have to cross. And of course, it's the dead of winter. Now let's talk a little bit here about why the British haven't stopped them. The British know what they're doing. They have spies everywhere. Um, and in fact, several of the spies come and tell the officers, listen, the Americans are dragging these cannons back to Boston from Fort Tecondaroga. The British, and by the way, the British system of being promoted is you have to come from the aristocracy um, to be an officer. Don't believe them. They say nobody would be that stupid to go out in the winter because because the rules of war are this, you fight in the spring, you fight in the summer, you fight in the fall, the winter, you don't fight. You go into a town, you rest, relax, go to the theater, and pick up. So to the British, they, they don't believe the Americans could do this. And they don't believe it could be done. But if they had, they could have easily attack Knox and knock them off. And by the way, the United States was half and half, half Tory, half rebel. So if, some, if a bunch of Tories got wind of this, they could have easily decimated, you know, Knox's small, small force, but they don't. So now they're heading for the Berkshires. Knox looks at him, this is a great picture. Knox looks at it and he, he writes. Now you remember, this is a guy who's never left Boston. And he writes and he says, I can see all the kingdoms of heaven from here. And he writes this in his journal. But he also realizes that it's almost impossible to pull these cannons up and over the Berkshires. And he writes, he says, I don't see how anybody could do this. He, does, he doesn't understand how that's going to happen because you know, this 120,000 pounds or 60 tons has to go up and over these incredible mountains. Well, they do it the way they've been doing it before. They use pulleys and oxen. Basically what they do is they unhook the oxen, they wrap the rope around the tree and use pulleys to give it more prep, more leverage. And then they rehook the oxen up and they pull up the, the cannons up the side of these very sheer mountains. And, and these mountains are sheer. There's, there's areas where they have to literally use block and tackle to lift the cannons up and over. And not only that, the air is getting thin. Uh, again, it's fro these men are frozen. They've been exposed to the elements for a very, very long time. And the Teamsters have had enough. Um, not Oxen is, or rather, Henry Knox is a great cheerleader. He keeps everybody going. He keeps them feeling like we can get this done. But in the end, they stop and they say, we can't go, we aren't going any further. This is impossible. We cannot get these cannons over this mountains. You know, we can't do this. Henry Knox is facing basically a disaster. George Washington desperately needs these cannons. In fact, during all this, he's writing to people saying, have you heard from Henry Knox? I need these cannons. 
So this whole thing could break down right here, right in the mountains. And Henry Knox then does what he does best. He gives a speech. And he basically says, this, what we're doing is not for us. It's for the unborn millions. It's for the people who are yet to come. We're creating this country. And what we do here will directly affect it. And after three hours of speaking, he gets them moving again. He promises them new um, oxen and things like that, but he basically gets them moving again. And really, for him, it's his crossing of the Delaware. And by the way, he will be instrumental in this too when this happens later. He will be the man getting everybody into the, those boats. But for him, this is his crossing of the Delaware. This is his bold movement. This is his moment where he has to deliver it and he has to do the unexpected thing. And he does keep them going. So they continue to the Berkshires and they reach one of the first towns. And what's happened is the news of this noble train has spread and people are starting to realize that, you know, this, this incredible thing's occurring. And, you know, when they hit towns, these are people who never leave their towns. It'd be like astronauts coming to your town. They see these big bearded men and these monstrous cannons and they're fascinated with it. But also they help them. <clears throat> they give them food, they move them along, uh, they give them support, they give them new fresh oxen. So this becomes sort of a ritual as so they start to hit these mountain towns. And then Knox would come in and he'd fire what's called Old Sal, which was this big mortar. And again, these people never heard a cannon fired. It would shake all the windows and people loved it. But it also, you know, again, the legend of the noble train is growing and they know that he's going to fight the British in Boston and that this, to liberate Boston. And, you know, the whole world's sort of watching this battle. Most of all, France, to see which way the wind's gonna blow in all of this. And so Knox gets through these towns and now he's getting closer and closer to Boston. And so finally, he goes ahead and he rides ahead and to Boston and uh, outside of Boston. And George Washington is coming out of a uh, meeting with his generals. And basically it's a very gloomy meeting where they're like, we can't do anything. We haven't heard from Henry Knox. This obviously has failed. He's never coming back with those cannons. Um, and the army's falling apart. The British could attack us at any moment and decimate our army. Um, so Washington goes outside this house and he's standing there in the snow and he's, sees a rider coming and the rider comes up washington waves off the sentinel and he sees this big bearded man on a horse with his left hand wrapped in a colorful scarf and he knows it's henry knox who's come back and he tells washington says i have arrived with your noble train of artillery now the, the noble train is probably 10 to 15 miles behind him but it's coming so officially they come in, they arrive back in Boston, January 24, 1776. Okay, so now the cannons are there. So this changes everything for Washington. All right, first of all, he now has a way to dislodge the British where he had none before. The British know nothing about this. They, if they do, they don't believe it, all right? So now he's got to figure out what's the best way to use these cannons. Now, remember we talked about Dorchester Heights. Well, Dorchester Heights sits over Boston and nobody occupies it. So Washington and Knox come up with a plan that in one night they will get all the cannons up to Dorchester Heights. And that's what they do. In one night, they drag them up using the oxen again, right? Same thing, using the oxen and the sleds, drag them up to the heights of Dorchester under the cover of darkness. They build fortifications up there. Later, the British will say, can't believe it. They'll, they'll be like, it must have taken 15,000 men to do what they did. But the Americans just, they, they get a full moon, they can see what they're doing, they get everything up there. And when the British wake up, right, the Dorchester Heights, is now in Boston, the British way in Boston, Dorchester Heights is now occupied by all these cannons, these 59 cannons, including the big Berthas. And George Washington then gives a speech. He comes up at dawn on March 5th, 1776, which is the anniversary of the Boston Massacre. And he says, again, 
this is for the future. What we do here will be remembered in all time. And then he gives Henry Knox the signal, and Knox begins the bombardment of Boston. Um, now, General Howe is asleep with his concubine in Boston when these shells start landing all around him. He comes running out into the street, and he looks up, and they see these cannons all lined up on Dorchester Heights, bombing and everything. And more than that, right, the bombing, the, the cannons are threatening the fleet in the harbor. Now, it would be a lucky shot because they're fairly far out there, but they can do it. And so the Admiral tells how either you get those cannons off Dorchester Heights or we're, we're taking off. Howe realizes what, what's occurred in, in that, you know, they can't even fire back because their cannons can't go that high in Dorchester Heights. And so Boston is just being shelled relentlessly. So Howe devises a plan to attack. Because he always said, you know, if they take it, we'll just take it back. Well, a freak snowstorm hits when all his troops are in the boats ready to go attack Dorchester Heights, which in fact, they would have been massacred because Washington was waiting for him to do that. And they never can attack. So then Howe has another war council. And basically, he says, we've got to go. We've got to leave. And so he lets Washington know that they're going to evacuate Boston. And that if they don't molest them, they won't burn the town. And so Washington says, fine. And so incredibly, incredibly, the British army, the entire British army, with all the Tories they could load into the ships, including Lucy Flucker's parents, who she will never see again, sail out of Boston. And the Americans have their first victory of the revolution. And this, this is incredible because France, many of the colonies who hadn't sent representatives to the Continental Congress are you know, amazed, and they realize that this is a real fight now, that Americans can fight, they can hold their own, and that there's a chance they can get their independence. So this is monumental. And Henry Knox watches from Dorchester Heights as those ships sail out. Little did the British know that that man up there, that big man with the long hair and the big beard, is the reason they are forced out of Boston. Now Henry goes back, and they, he goes back in, leads the procession into Boston, as the British left, and he goes back to his bookstore. And it's ransacked, it's destroyed, books are all over the ground and everything. But he does go in there and he has a moment where he realizes how far he's come in a year. That he now is the reason the American army had a victory over, over the British. And, and it's a very poignant moment for him as he comes back as the prodigal son who has made good. And again, this gives the Americans the first victory of the revolution when it, they were very much in danger of just falling apart. And how never believed, you know, the Americans would ever have a chance. He figured in the spring, he was getting reinforcements constantly. They were going to just crush them in the spring. And that this, he didn't take George Washington seriously and take the American army seriously. Um, but this made the world take them seriously. Now, Henry Knox will go on when Washington forms a cabinet and he becomes the first secretary of the war. Um, Knox was very good as a man in government, but really uh, he, he was Washington's right-hand man all the way through the revolution, all the way up to Yorktown. And that was probably when he was in his finest. Certainly when he was taking those, the noble train to Washington, this was his moment. This was what he was put on earth to do. And again, you know, Knox proved necessity is the mother of invention. In fact, the whole revolution proved that, this fact. Um, Henry Knox will eventually leave government service. And one thing he never did was he, he never made much money. So he wanted to try and cash in, if you will. And he builds himself a big, big mansion up in Maine. And, uh, but he's not a good businessman. Um, he loses a lot of money, uh, and f unfortunately, most of his children die. It's very tragic. Uh, most of his children wouldn't survive. And then he actually uh, is eating a chicken bone, and it gets caught in his throat, and then later his throat gets infected, and that's what kills him on October 21st, 1806. Again, 
the money's not there. Uh, Lucy is left on this big mansion, this big estate. She has to sell most of it to pay debts. And in fact, she will eventually die destitute. Um, now, 1926, Massachusetts and New York put up 56 markers to follow Henry Knox's Nobel train. And, and it's really a fascinating drive to take because you realize, you realize even though the topography has changed, what he went through and how far they had to go. It's, it's very hard to believe that he did this with oxen and sleds. Um, but he did. And the Nobel train, again, has been this sort of footnote of history that you sort of heard of, but you didn't know a lot about. And that's why I was, you know, so taken with uh, writing this as a book, because I wanted people to know what Henry Knox did. We know of Fort Knox. Um, but this is, this is his moment that he did for the unborn millions. And that brings me to the end. So, oh, thank you for coming. I think we're going to take some questions now. Yeah, there. thank you so much. Um, so um, I'll just, uh, for those of you who haven't attended a webinar like this before, um, there are a couple of ways to ask questions. Uh, one, if you uh, mouse down um, on your screen, you should see a little box that says chat. So that's one way um, you can type your questions in there. Um, if you'd like to ask your question in person, um, there is also an option to uh, to raise your hand. Um, and it looks like a couple people have done that. So it uh, looks like uh, Virginia has raised her hand. So I'm going to click to allow Virginia to talk. Uh, let's see, just a second here. I'm going to unmute you, Virginia. Uh, let's see. Hello? There you are. Oh, I had to unmute myself, I guess. Uh, hey, Bill, how are you doing? You are wonderful. How's it going? It's going good. I wanted to know, like, what were some of those, like, those original documents that you found? Where did you go to get this information? Like, what library did you hit? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, like I said, there was Henry Knox's uh, original journal, so I used that. And then there were the papers of Henry Knox. Um, okay. In Boston, Boston Library. Okay. Um, those extensively, and then there was two military men who wrote. One guy wrote this little pamphlet um, uh, in 1976. He was a retired general, and he. It's this. I, I found it on the internet, and it's just this little pamphlet. But he did a lot of the heavy lifting, of figuring out actually what happened. And, and, you know, because there's a lot of mythology around the, the noble train, uh, and a lot of it's just not true. Um, and then there was another military man named Thomas Campo, who in 2005 wrote a study for the Defense Department about the noble train and how it was done. And that was fascinating because it was, you know, sort of in modern terms. And, you know, the Defense Department's kind of hilarious because they, they were very very elaborate terms for oxen and sleds and things like that. But it was really good because he basically figured out that Knox had five groups, five packets uh, that he did. He moved them. So there was five different groups of oxen and sleds loaded with cannons with, with soldiers. And these all moved off kind of following each other like a caterpillar. But, you know, that's how they did it. They, were, they sort of moved independently and the five groups arrived together. Oh, wow. Well, that's, it was wonderful. I, you know, we gotta read this book and the library has to get it. <laughs> hey, yeah, do me a favor since, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if the trades are still reviewing or not because, uh, you know, there's been no reviews on it. And I think it's because everybody's at home. Yeah, I don't know, Kristen. <laughs> So, yeah, first to make sure you get a copy that begins. Well, you know, uh, I know a lot of the publishers are, you know, some of them have like moved publishing dates to further in the fall. Right. Um, I know that um, some publishers were not sending out the print galleys. So, oh. uh, you know, and then some of the reviewers, they, they only want the print galleys and they don't want right. to 
obviously the e galleys so so that could also influence you know what shows up in the um in the review publications but but yeah um you know uh i assume you know there's um room for um you know certainly on on amazon and, and once we get you know once we get copies um you know people can can write reviews um, right. but yeah um that is that is uh be a good one for a collection consequence. Others, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah okay see looks like we have a question from chat um from mary who said fun and inter interesting presentation of this story really a gem a key important part of the revolutionary war that really is not told in our history classes. And I, excuse me, my cat was just crawling on me. I forgot to close the door. <laughs> um, she also says, a story of perseverance that should be taught in our military academies. Wow. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Absolutely. Very good. Absolutely. I was really um, taken with just, I mean, just the number of things that went wrong. Oh, <laughs> and you know, the book. Back, and it was really incredible. And it, the number of things that went right, too. I mean, just yeah. how um, it was, it was really, um, you know, it's, it's like they say truth is, is uh, um, harder to believe sometimes than fiction. So, yeah, well, and in the book, you, you just wouldn't believe, I mean, I, I hit all the high points. But just the things they went through are incredible, you know, just the hardships and, you know, that they actually were able to get these back. Again, uh, yeah. their backs are against the wall. So, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. That was great. It was just great, Bill. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, okay. many more to come. Oh, yay. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll see you at a Barnes and Noble again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when they when they open up again, right? Right. <laughs> I think those are necessary places. I don't know <laughs> libraries. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Well, it's good to see you. It was great to see you. Okay. Take care. You too. All right. Does anyone have any other questions or comments? Um, like I said, you can uh, drop a question or comment in chat or. Uh, or raise your hand if you'd like to. Um, if you'd like to speak, I'd be happy to uh, unmute you. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending, and um, and thank you to our presenter, William. That was that was really great. Well, really appreciate it. All right. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>